Welcome to our book chat featuring Patina Gappa, the author of Out of Darkness, Shining Light, and our host, Kina Likimani. Please give them a special Ake welcome. Welcome to our book chat.
back to back. In the meantime, I was working on Out of Darkness Shining Light. I was working on Mount Pleasant. I was working on Ballantine Park. I was working on... Are they all <laughs> novels, by the way? Um, yes, okay. I have... Um, I'm trying to do a Quentin Tarantino. You know, Quentin Tarantino said he wants to do 10 films. I'm a novelist. I want to do 10 books, then I've, I'll become a filmmaker. <laughs> No, actually, I really just want to be a playwright. Okay. And, and you know, if you're a playwright, publishers really hate you. Yeah, they do. I, I said to my, my American publisher, oh, we've just done my first play, and it was so... And she just rolled her eyes, and she said, oh, God, not you too. You know? <laughs> so, but that's what I want to do. I want to do theater. Hmm. I remember, um, and the first book is an elegy for Easterly. Yes. And I remember the reception in the West. It's like... You know how they always need a totem? I call it it's native informant. Yes. I was treated yes. as a native informant, yeah. But then you brought this up. You said government. Because then you go and work for the government. Yes. And let me say this. Let me just get this out of there. I believe no African writer should work for a government. Whether they are left-leaning or right-leaning or whatever. Mm. One, because African writers are really doing the work of freedom. Mm. And two, is because the government, they will either waste your time or kill you. <laughs> and I'm saying this as a daughter of a writer who, who worked with Rollins. Yes. You know, and my mother said, but Kina, what if your books are not getting the change you want? I said, no, never. So what, and, I, and, I, and we'll come back to that later. We don't really want to talk about that. But what, I mean to, what I'm interested in about working for the government mm. was, were you still writing? Yes, I was. I was writing Out of Darkness, Shining Light. I was finalizing that manuscript and also working on the first one. But you know, Kina, um, I don't see myself just as a writer because I'm really not. Writing is my second career. It's one in which I have done remarkably well considering that I actually started publishing uh, at the age of, my first book was published when I was 37. But between the ages of 26, and 26 when I finished my PhD, and 37 when I published my, my first book. I was an international trade lawyer. And what I do is advise governments, right? I've advised, you know, we've advised um, Colombia, for instance, on compulsory licensing. We dismantled the US Farm Bill, the cotton subsidies on behalf of Chad and Benin, right? I've advised Hong Kong, China. I've advised India. We dismantled the sugar protocol of the EU, an essential part of the common agricultural policy that was very wasteful and meant that developing countries weren't getting the right price for their sugar, right? So that's what I do. I'm an international trade lawyer. I work with governments. I've always worked with governments. So even as I was seemingly throwing stones at the Mugabe regime, they were one of my clients through the Africa group because I advised the African the Africa group in the WTO. So I've always worked with government. So to me, it didn't seem like something particularly out of step. What was out of step was the publicity around it because it became publicly known. And what I actually did was to write a new investment law and set up a new investment agency, right, that allows private uh, investment to come in in an equitable and sustainable manner, to kill corruption, right? To, to ensure that um, our local industries are protected. So we have certain areas that we, we protect from private investment, like hairdressers or you know, public transport and so on. So it was very well-considered work that I'm actually very proud of. But of course, I completely appreciate that many like you would believe that working for government is not something that a writer should do. <laughs> That's fine. Um, let's go to your process of writing. Mm. Yeah, because <laughs> I could go on that one mm. forever. I will not. What was your first idea for a book? My first idea for a book was the David Livingstone story mm -hmm. from the point of view of the Africans. I wrote it on a floppy disk mm -hmm. in 1998. So that's why, it, and at that time, 
where's some cooking? I called it Mwili wa Dawudi. And you know what that means? It's Swahili for the body of David. Because that's what the companion said when they deposited his body at the church in, uh, in Bagamoyo. So I really wanted, I've always been obsessed with exploration anyway. When I was a kid, I thought I'd grow up to discover the source of the Nile. You know, <laughs> because you know, I, was, I, was raised, I was raised as a roadie, right? It took me a long time to get rid of the accent, but I was raised as a roadie. And if you're raised as a roadie, by roadie I mean Rhodesian. Rhodesia. Right, Rhodesian, because I was raised, uh, I was one of the first white ki uh, well, black kids to integrate a former white school. So, you know, the British like heroic failure. You know, they like, they like Kate Middleton, not Meghan Markle, right? <laughs> they, they, like <laughs> they like Captain Scott, don't really admire Amundsen, because Amundsen actually made it to the South Pole, because they ate his dogs, by the way. And uh, Livingston refused to eat his dogs. Sorry, not Livingston. Scott refused to eat his dogs. And by the way, Scott also carried a huge amount of silver. You know, he was an officer and a gentleman, so he had silver. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who carries silver to the South Pole? You know, Scott did. That's why he lost the race. Uh, and, you know, Amundsen, you know, Norwegian, Kontiki Expedition, you know, Hardy and all that. So I really thought I loved those guys. To find the Nile, ins instead of, you know, maybe asking people for directions, <laughs> right? Hello, there's this big river Nile. Do you know where it begins? You know, so they might have said, you know, go further up to Uganda, Ethiopia. Don't come to Zambia, bad idea. But anyway, the, f <laughs> the fact that, you know, he failed made him a hero and made him a very admirable hero because he died trying, don't you know? You know, very, very British, very, you know, very British. So, yeah, but then as I grew older, and I did, we were the second year in my country in 1985 to do the decolonized history of Africa. The story was now flipped and as much attention was given to the companions to the extent that we knew about them as to Livingston. So I have a notebook in which I wrote in my form, form three handwriting, his faithful companions, Chuma and Susi, carried uh, no, buried his heart under a tree and carried his body for nine months. And then that became kind of a lifelong obsession because as a child, you think of two people carrying a body. But then as I grew older and I began to research the story, it became the most really, the most absolutely remarkable thing I could think of. Who carries a dead body? And what did they do with it? I mean, I kept asking the mechanics of it. And then when I discovered what they did, that's when I realized, damn, I have a book here. Because basically the whole, they buried his heart under a mvula tree because he loved Africa so much. You know, the very romantic Victorian thing. It was a practical thing. They buried not just his heart, but his intestines and his liver and his spleen and everything inside him because they had to, no, not even embalm him, they had to dry him. You've heard of Biltong? Right? <laughs> right. So for the, fir for the longest time, I called it my Livingston jerky novel. Because they made the guy into jerky, right? Oh. No, it's true. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to, to do this to you. Yes. I'm sorry to, to spoil your romantic Victorian notions. But they basically, you know, opened him up, eviscerated him, buried everything, including the heart, under him tree. Then they splayed him out like this for five days, and then they turned him over and did his backside for five days until he was nice and crunchy, right? <laughs> and then they folded him in half, right? And so they sort of like folded him in half like this and disguised him as a package for trade. Very clever, because imagine, this is Africa, 1873, and you're moving from village to village with a dead body. Do you think people will let you pass? No, they'll, they'll think you know, you're some kind of witches. So they had to pretend to be a traveling party. You know, do, 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 do. Oh, this lumpy thing here that looks like a Biltong David Livingston. Oh, that's not a body. This is just a package for trade. It's a bolt of cloth. So they had to carry out serious subterfuge, right? They had to be, to use deception to get um, this Scottish man off the soil of Africa. 
to be buried in Westminster Abbey. So when I discovered all those hilarious bits, I knew I had a novel. Because one of the women, uh, Halima, who narrates the story, decides, uh, so what are we going to do with this thingamabob? <laughs> right? <laughs> I think we should just give him a posthumous circumcision that goes all the way, <laughs> and we bury it with the heart. <laughs> so in my imagination, they buried his heart and his dick in Africa. This is going so much better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let me say that um, <laughs> the no. So let me plug the book. You guys, it's on, it's on sale. Please go and buy it. Um, the no, the all of her books, but especially what we're talking about, Out of Darkness, Shining Light. Um, you are the second African writer. I think Leila Lalami did the most account in which she also rescues from erasure um, the companions of explorers who have That's died right. on an island. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't know that um, Levinson had a failed mission till I, till I read the book. And I started researching for this one. I had no idea. That he had a? A failed mission. I had no idea. All I knew was I was an explorer. And mm. in fact, I finished high school in Zimbabwe, went to Victoria Falls and there is a plug for him and whatever. Well, where did you go to high school in Zimbabwe? She's a PC. Oh, that's why you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, no, no, there's a, there's a reason for this. Yes. There's a reason for this. Yes. You know, uh, Chizzy is a private school. Yes. It's a very Tony private school. Chizzy, Arundel Convent, all those yes. schools. So the decolonized history yes. that we did, you guys didn't we, do. Because when, I got, when we got to Zimbabwe, because my mother had left the government, thank God. Mm. Um, all spaces for black people, all the spaces in public school were reserved for Zimbabweans. Yeah. I don't count whites. I, if I say, so I don't say things like black African because there's no such a thing. So if I say Zimbabweans, you must know I refer to black people mm. because we shall not be othered on our own continent. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we got to Zimbabwe, yeah. all the public um, school spots were for Zimbabweans. Yeah. So my mother had no choice but to put me in cheese. It was a trip, but I, so I didn't know this thing about Livingston. So, so there's this, there's this kid, I have to tell you about Chizzy. You, this will make you delighted. There's this kid who's a friend, uh, the daughter of a friend of mine, who has started a revolution at Chizzy. Mm. Do you believe in 2023, they're still not allowed to speak Shona during oh break my time? God. Right, because the white teachers are scared they'll be talking about them, right? <laughs> right, and they're not allowed to sing, you know, those war cries. Yes. Like, for, you, you, know, you can't sing in Shona. And then, they went there, Kina. They went for this girl's natural hair. Oh, no. It looks messy. Very. It looks untidy. Oh. Uh, so she said, you know what? We are going to decolonize the school. Yeah. So she created a, a bit of a ruckus. I mean, it was, um, <laughs> as a West African girl, going, it, it was just unbelievable. Mm. Um, the school and Zimbabwe at the time. But anyway, um, so... What you do in Out of Darkness is completely brilliant and amazing. I mean, I don't, um, I, I, people just have to read it. But, but what I love about it also is that we need to start, I hate telling writers what to do, but anyway, we need to start imagining our histories. You know what I'm trying, and playing with our histories. I remember when the, the, the wonderful movie, The Woman King, came out. A lot of white people were like, mm, this is not historically accurate. Well, fuck that. <laughs> because I do not know the many versions and revisions and retelling of the Arthurian legend that I myself, Kina, have. Yes. Yes. So thank you. Um, we'll, so please, please, yes, buy, buy books. That's why you're here. But um, talking about your process, so my, my mother just died, as in in May, it's not a just, so I'll bring her up. So what my mother, the writer Mate used to do, mm. is she would get a brilliant idea for a novel. And then she would say, oh, this, this novel is going to be big. I don't know what to do. And then in the meantime, when people are saying, you need to publish something, she'll just put together a collection of short stories or a collection of poetry. That's what you did, isn't mm, it? Mm. 
because you had started with out of darkness, but you were also still writing. Because this idea that writers have one big idea, while you are working and researching that idea, but you're, of course, also writing. Hmm. You know, I, I'm a little bit different in my approach to short stories because I write novels <laughs> because I want to, but also really to keep my publishers happy. Exactly. But if it was just up to me, I would be a short story writer who writes plays, right? Because that's really where my love is. I actually looked for an agent who believes in short stories. My agent at WME, Eric Simonoff. And he believes in short stories so much that he got me to the New Yorker as the first ever Zim you know, Zimbabwean to publish fiction in 90 years, right? And I love that about him, and, and, I, and I love working with him. And I've got a new collection coming out at some point. It's called International People, and it's inspired by a, a cabinet meeting that Idi Amin had one time <laughs> <laughs> when he said, he was telling his, he's threatening his cabinet uh, uh, ministers, I've got international people who come and tell me things, <laughs> things that I need to know about you. I have my international people, right? So I love this idea of there are people who are so special that they're international people, right? Yes. <laughs> and, and these international people in my book, um, initially they worked for a trade organization. Then I thought, you know, my friends will think I'm writing about them. But I've, <laughs> I've just become so fascinated looking at how elections are observed looking at the machinations of governments, how governments run away from unfavorable reports, create noise around something else. So I've created this agency based in Geneva that just goes around Africa, Asia, and Latin America observing elections, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So the messier an election is, the happier they are, Yes. right? It's like, it's like the World Bank. I mean, if the world developed today, people would be out of jobs, right? Yes. <laughs> so that's why there's really no interest in development. But you know, you know, this, this agency doesn't really want a clean election because the raison d'etre will, will, have, will have disappeared. Uh, but so my point really is that to me, short stories are, are important and uh, as serious as novels. But I love what Ama Ataidu used to do because I do the same thing, which is I jot down ideas. And then sometimes an idea becomes a novel, sometimes it becomes exactly, a play, yeah. sometimes it becomes yes, a short yes, story. Yes, 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 you just yes. have to let it sit for a bit and then it will kind of, you know, reveal itself to you, I think. I love, you said it's called International People. International People. I love the title. Titles are so important. By the way, writers, please do not slave away for 10 years and then give your book a horrible title. I don't understand. <laughs> but I love, because in Ghana, you know, in, for people who are not decolonized across, international, the word international, <laughs> That's a lot of work. Even the churches. Yes. Power in the God International. Thank you. <laughs> Established 2020. Thank you. <laughs> there is an international school in my village, and only Ghanaians go there. <laughs> and it, so it has made me hate the word local. Because again, when you are not decolonized, then the local is a backward, far away thing from the center. So I'll be sitting in Ghana, and people will be like, we are having local cuisine. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's local cuisine. What is local attire? Oh, uh, Kina, 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 don't get me started on continental breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Which continent? <laughs> Which continent? <laughs> Which continent? How are we not continental? Huh? The other continent is the continental one. So, <laughs> so really, honestly, thank you. This goes to say, please, you know, you must try and drop local, mm. as it refers to anything Nigerian, Ghanaian, Zimbabwean, African, please. And we must <laughs> stop saying black so-and-so <laughs> on our own continent, no. Uh, yes, can I, can, can I just say yes. that, you know, so I, I met the delightful and extremely attractive <coughs> Tony Khan oh. earlier. <laughs> I Tony puts the T in patriarchy, <laughs> where is he? <laughs> Tony, where are you? Stand no, up, no. stand up. It's, Everybody it's must know. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's no secret that I've had a long, long uh, crush he on Tony Khan for he the longest time. He did a wonderful time. review of your book. <laughs> oh no, I tell him at every opportunity, but still he won't leave his wife. What can you do? <laughs> um, 
No, we had a, we had a delightful session. Uh, my first uh, Ake session, actually, Lola, thank you so much for that, was with Tony Khan. And I was saying to some friends earlier, I always introduce him by saying he has the best book title of any book apart from one. His book is called The Nights of the Creaking Bed. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And then the best book title, he's only beaten by the Haitian Canadian writer Denis Laferriere, mm -hmm. whose book is called <coughs> How to Make Love to a Negro. <laughs> and then in brackets, without getting tired. <laughs> My mom and I love this. I've forgotten her name, but the book title is A History of Tractors in the Ukrainian. Mommy loved the book. I hated it, but what's her title? It's a wonderful title. Oh, yes. No, titles are important. Ta very. Thank you. Yeah. Thank please. Yes. So, um, what are you working on now? Ah, I was hoping you would ask that because I have two books coming out next year on the same day because they are related. So, I started writing a memoir. Right, in part to answer these questions about you know working for government and all that, and then I realized I was doing this thing that I really hate, which is that I was doing a lot of self justification. Right, um, I call it the safe harbor of self justification, and I don't like that. I, I prefer to be judged by my words, not to have to explain myself over and over. So I thought to myself, I've been writing since 1997, publishing newspaper columns and so on, and I look at that body of work and I haven't changed at all. I'm still the same person, right? So I thought maybe let that writing speak for itself. So I've got an essay collection called This Dream Called Zimbabwe because my first essay for The Gui Guardian was about the dream of Zimbabwe will live, but we'll sort it out ourselves. Thank you very much, right? Um, so I have that essay collection. It's about gosh, it's, it's long, it's like 180,000 words or something. And then I was also writing a memoir because my brother died last year. He was just 38 in a terrible car accident. And my father died two years before that. And I started to think a lot about legacy because they died two such different deaths. You know, my dad, my dad is crazy. You, you're gonna hear an expert here. He, he walked us around the lawn saying, uh, 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 uh. I don't want the funeral fires to spoil the lawn. So you put them here. And then he measured the distance between the fires where the women cook and the toilet and the kitchen and everything was equidistant because he was a very rational person. And you know, we found in his suit pocket, he chose his own suit. We found you know, notes because he didn't want us to hassle and struggle for money. And then my, my mom called me, I was out of the country. And she's like, mashura and I tirwana babo ako. Your father, he is completely crazy. He walked me to town to pick his own coffin. You know, so he was that kind of person, right? He was completely prepared for death. He had his will done. He had, in his briefcase, we found the things that made him most proud. The title deeds to his two houses. Um, the first, a copy of the first uh, uh, registration book for his first car, a Peugeot 404 that he bought in 1974. You know, men and their cars. And all our school reports. All of us, you know, the five of us, all our school reports. So he lived a very, very uh, ordered life. And I would like to read from just a tiny excerpt from the memoir so that you understand the kind of book it is. What's the title of the memoir? The title is Heaven is a Library. <laughs> oh, isn't that a sweet title? Oh my God. <laughs> That is because it's inspired by the statement by Bourget, you know, Jean-Louis Bourget, who said, uh, I've always imagined paradise to be a kind of library. So it's a book that looks at my life and especially my childhood through the 10 libraries that formed me. So each chapter relates to a particular library. So I'm just going to start reading uh, an excerpt about my family. <coughs> These are the moments that I remember with great fondness. The five of us and our parents 
gathered around our black and white television set until my mother went to South Africa and brought back a color TV. There was just one channel in those days. The broadcast began at six each evening and ended at exactly midnight. The six hours book ended by the doleful playing of the old national anthem. We loved shows like Sounds on Saturday, a local music show, and soaps like Falcon Crest, Dynasty, and Dallas. We especially loved Santa Barbara. We didn't know that it was actually a fast-moving daily soap in the US, or that it had been bought by ZBC because it was cheap. For us, it was a slow-moving weekly show, meaning that I can remember Augusta Lockridge and her husband Lionel having the same argument in the same clothes for more than a month. <laughs> and Dominic, who was really Kelly and Eden's mother, Sophia, in disguise, hid in the same corner for two months of Fridays. We memorized the adverts that played in the breaks and chanted them in mad medleys when the television was not on. What do you think you're doing? Making sure it's sunlight clean. Sunlight clean, it has a fresh, sharp smell. And the lather, it cuts through everything. So your soul don't sunlight. Why not, when just a teaspoonful makes everything sunlight clean? What's cooking, good looking, what you feeding us tonight? Spaghetti, macaroni, that's an Uber treat, so right? <laughs> Down in the country, Early each morning, cows are making nest spray. Nest spray? Yes, nest spray. <laughs> As my little brother Uchi became older, we became addicted to the WWF wrestling show. We didn't know that the whole thing was staged, so it us, <laughs> to us it seemed real. We knew the names of the wrestlers, their personalities, and personal grudges. How Hogan and the Macho Man the Undertaker and Rollicking Ring Robin, Scary Sherry and Miss Elizabeth, vivid characters that we rooted for and argued over and my brothers imitated the next day with their friends. One of my most vivid memories is of my little brother Uchi bursting into tears when Hulk Hogan was defeated by the Macho Man, who from that moment became the Macho King, Randy Savage. My father tried to comfort him but I could tell that my father was just as upset as my little brother. <laughs> Only he, being the adult, was forced to hold back his tears. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he will win next time. <laughs> Another of my dad's gapparisms was that everything had to be spotlessly clean. When we were not at school, we had assigned tasks and chores. My brother Ratio had the task of washing the car, which had to be spotlessly clean. We all had the task of making the garden spotlessly clean. Litter, litter was under no circumstances acceptable. Every week we had the job of picking out any little stones that might get in the way of the lawnmower before my father cut the lawn. That lawn was his pride and joy. It had to be spotlessly clean. Petna, he would call. Regina, Ratiere, and you, the cat, the cat. Dinodakuana pesa papari, spotlessly clean. The cat, the cat, is what he called my sister Bimbai, who was then stumbling through her first reader and making agonizing work of it. The cat ran from the dog. See, the cat ran. Oh, oh, cat, run, cat, run. <laughs> <laughs> On being commanded to ensure that the lawn was spotlessly clean, we would comb the lawn for any little stones. It was frankly astonishing just how stony that lawn got during the week. Then, after we made sure the lawn was spotlessly clean, my father mowed the lawn up and down in his khaki shorts, mowing the lawn, going up and down in his bare feet, just as he had once plowed the fields of his home in rural Gutu. One year, 
the confectionery maker Dandy decided that a good way to entice the nascent children to buy its chewing gum was to include the flag of a different country in each pack. Everyone at our school went crazy for the bubblegum flags. My siblings and I wanted to collect them too, especially because it would allow us to have one up on my father's favorite game. Wherever he drove us to school, he liked to test our knowledge of, the wo of world geography, firing questions at us in turn. Pedna, what is the capital of Switzerland? Mm, Zurich? No, it's Bern. Regina, what is the capital of South Africa? Johannesburg? No, Pretoria. Ratieri, what is the capital of Venezuela? Venezuela City? No, <laughs> you are confusing it with Mexico. It's Caracas. Caracas is the capital of Venezuela. <laughs> the dandy cars came with a flag of the country on one side, and then on the other, basic facts about the capital, the size, and population of each country. We coveted those cars. But there was one problem. We were not allowed to chew gum. Gum offended my father's notion of everything being spotlessly clean because gum had the careless habit of being deposited in inconvenient places. <laughs> my father also said that people who chewed gum looked like they were chewing the cud. And as we were not cows, there was no need for us to chew gum. <laughs> so we bought the gum secretly and collected the dandy cards. Indeed, my father was amazed by our suddenly improved knowledge of the world's capital cities. But then came the great gum crisis. One of us carelessly left a bit of chewed gum on the kitchen table, and my father, with his unerring instinct of sniffing out things that were not spotlessly clean, found it. He called a summit in the living room. <laughs> we, we sat opposite him in order of height and age. <laughs> we were all raised to be honest. And in any event, lying to my father was pointless because he grilled the truth out anyway. Who chewed the gum? was the same salvo he fired to each of us. We all did, we said, thinking, ha, safety in numbers. <laughs> but my father was not done. He demanded to know what we had each done with our gum after we spat it out. My brother Rachel said he had accidentally swallowed his gum, something that could not be proved, at least not immediately. <laughs> so for him, there was a temporary reprieve. I said my gum was in the bin. He searched the bin until he found it. <laughs> My sister Vibai said she had thrown hers into the hedge that separated our house from the house of the horrible white mechanic who lived next door. Our father shepherded us to the same spot, shook the hedge until he found the gum. Wow. <laughs> My sister Regina said she had thrown her gum on the roof. My father went to the storeroom <laughs> <laughs> next to the carport. He got out the ladder. <laughs> I can still see him now in his khaki shorts and buckless bank t-shirt, climbing up the ladder to the roof and walking barefoot on the black tiles, inspecting every inch of the roof. There was no gum on any of the tiles and none in the rain gutters. There was no gum on the chimney. There was no gum anywhere on that roof, my father said after he came down. That roof, he said, is... And for once in our lives, that was definitely not a good thing. Thank you so much. We look forward to the book. I'm opening up the Q&A. Um, and I have some rules. There shall be no personal statements. You are asking questions. I do not want long introductions. One, at most, two questions per person. If you have a comment, you want to say how much you appreciate her work, she'll be signing books. If you do not abide by any of this, you will sit down and shut up. <laughs> questions. I have to bow to you. I came all the way from Mozambique. Lola, thank you so much for making this possible. Can I bid for that book, please? I want to publish you in Mozambique. Oh, the only personal statement. Oh, 
Okay. If you are not making an offer to the writer, you cannot make personal statements. Ah, okay. but what is this? Can you I tell you, uh, Tamale, right? Yes. yes, yes. Can I tell you how happy that makes me? Because guess what? This book, it wasn't rejected by my what I what I'm hoping will be my new publisher in the UK. He just said, not right now, let's go with the novel. And I understand why, you know, you're moving to a new house and you want to start with a bang and to them a bang is a novel. But this is a novel, uh, this is a book for my people on this continent. Yes. This is a book about how you can write with love about a family, yes. right? It doesn't have to be all about female genital mutilation. No. Bad as that is, right? Um, so, and, and one of the things he said was, my God, the focus on education. And I said, do you not know any Africans? Yeah. Do you not know how people got to the middle class? Yes. The sacrifices they made, the aspirations for their children. That's the story of my father's life. I'm here because of my father. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a love letter to my father, Thank to you. our family, and, and to my country. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll Thank talk. You. There's a young yeah. woman here um, I met in the bookstore, and she said she was tired of reading about African trauma. <laughs> and I understood. <laughs> so who, if she's here, buy the book when it comes. Save up your student money. So I, I wanted to ask about the, the playwriting, really. Uh, what play are you writing? And if it's not Mpandawana Dancing Champions, why? Mpandawana Dancing Champion has been turned into a play. Yes. Yeah. We are actually performing part of it on Saturday the 7th of December to celebrate 25 years That's of That's a short Press. story? It's a short story, From yes. your first yeah. book, yes. Yeah, uh, but right now I've just finished the Dambuzo Marechera story. <laughs> Good really? Lord. Good Lord, I've got a play. Good Lord, I, 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 I've, I've come from England. I've come from England. <laughs> England is a bitch, said, the, said the, 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 the Duchess to the bishop, you know. So it's, it's sort of like Dambuzo Marechera comes home and only to find that his book, Black Sunlight, has been banned. So he's kind of like fighting the system, he's fighting everything, and that's when, you know, his um, well-noted uh, schizophrenia kind of like comes back. So that's the play I've just finished. Thank you so much for the oh, interest. Oh, that's Vicky. great. Um, what impact has spotlessly clean <laughs> have your o had on your own life, if any? Um, let's just say that we all, to a degree, suffer from OCD. I mean, we, we've got a number of spectrum conditions, and certainly mine is OCD. So I can't stand it when things are not straight. So to drive me crazy, my son, who just moved the remote control like, ding, you know, <laughs> just a degree, right? Or just, you know, leave my books scattered, and, and I go, oh, you know. So yeah, we, we certainly, uh, all of us, I think, we have an obsession with order. And I have an obsession with detail, right? And uh, we, we are also extremely, um, uh, it's a childhood, right, where our father, because of his own privations and the lessons from his father, he was extremely tough on us. We used to peer review each other's reports <laughs> <laughs> before the concept of peer review came. Petna, what do you think of Ratia's <laughs> report? It wasn't exactly calculated to create uh, sibling unity, but we were united <laughs> against them, right? And then I've got another passage, you know, my mom chiming in like my dad's Greek chorus, you know, and then they would end up arguing whether they were talking about the same thing, and then would kind of escape, because now they're arguing about, you know, whether independence and freedom are the same thing, <laughs> because my dad said independence is important, and my mom said, no, you said freedom, but freedom, you know. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, we, we've had, a, we, we, we are, I mean, Sukiswa knows us very well. Uh, my, my president, uh, this president, President Mnangagwa, when he met my sister, she went to the State House to present the, um, I think it was the COVID preparedness report. She works for UNDP. She went with her boss. And he said, Gapo, 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 Regina, Regina, do you know Petna? <laughs> and <laughs> just like, you know, how my, it's a very Karanga way of pronouncing our names. And Regina said, yes, she's my sister. And he said, Hish. Uh, was, was your father appeasing the ancestors using rice wine? Because, because you are at the UN, she was at the WTO. How on earth did that happen? You know? So it, it was so lovely that, you know, um, you know uh, even the president kind of like recognizes my father's, uh, um, because we are my father's creations very much so. 
So yeah, so the spotlessly clean really has, <laughs> you know, walked us through all the lives that we've lived. Thank you so much for that kind question. Um, Platina, I've only read one of your books. It's brilliant. Yeah, I intend to change my, you know, mend my ways. <laughs> So um, my question is, um, your work really, it, it's, it's beautiful to read, you know, and um, in my opinion, it's almost cinematic. So what I'm trying to ask is, are there any movie deals on the horizon? <laughs> we, we almost, we came close with Out of Darkness, and I think we are likely to come close again. I have some friends who know people at Netflix, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. So, I don't know, but uh, I think it's the most filmic of my books, and... I think there's something sensational happening, and I know there's a wonderful panel later on about, you know, just Jagun Jagun, the, the film. Yeah. But there's something happening with African storytelling. The world is thirsty and hungry for our stories. So I'm certainly hoping that um, if we can't find the money to make the film ourselves in Zim and South Africa, um, it, it might be picked up internationally. But I've got other things that are coming that are even more filmic, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're fantastic, and both of you actually. And Lola, thank you for, for bringing us here and for sharing the stories. Uh, it, some of the things you're talking about, the decolonization of our stories and our all being itself. It's I in 2023, I think you, you said it, in some schools in Zimbabwe or I Ghana. think in Ghana, yeah. and we are uh, in Ethiopia or any other African country, we're going through the same thing. Mm. And our textbooks and our academic books are colonized, still we're not there yet. But there are many things that we cannot be able to share through, uh, I have been an academic publisher for the last 25 years, but I, I see the future in our sanity and liberty lies in fiction and poetry so that we can touch the soul of our society. In that way that I think you are doing that uh, from the small I saw and um, I hope that we'll get your books uh, in all the places that we are, and, uh, uh, and then we will definitely start the liberation movement in a new way, uh, the second phase of the liberation movement, the, the decolonizing our mind and our stories. Thank you so much again. So he didn't ask a question, but I allowed this because, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't ask a question, he made a statement, but I allowed it for two things. He kept using the word decolonize. He must know me in a previous life. But also the point he's making is important and I hope he takes his own advice. Why do I say this? Successful African publishing houses only publish for education. Mm -hmm. And that is not freedom. Because you know, our governments are our second colonial forces. So <laughs> what we need is for the publishing houses that make extraordinary amount of money of government contracts to then use that money to build a readership outside of education in, because that's how we're going to get free. We're not going to get free with public, uh, government contracts, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Esky, hi. Um, I just want to know, was it hard writing about your father, seeing that you wrote about him after he died? Uh, actually, you know, I started writing this book before my father died. At that time, it was called 10 Libraries. And it was just a very sort of, it, it was more focusing on the libraries than on the childhood. So it was a story about, it was a memoir about my, my love for books, right? I even <laughs> had <laughs> an appendix of every book I've ever read, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so it was 10 libraries, but then the 11th library, and, and I don't know if any of you know Walter Benjamin. <coughs> He's got a wonderful uh, essay called Unpacking My Library. So I talk about my own library because I have about 10,000 books, right? And they've been with me around the world, right? So that was what the book was. And then my father died. And I was working on other things. And then when my brother died, that, that really shook me up. He was only 38. <laughs> and not only that, but he leaves us a little joke, right? Which is that he had a, you know, th there was a baby that was born four days before he died, <laughs> right? So now there's a surprise, right? And now we have to, we're reeling. It's like, what, what, what? what? But we gave him a Yoruba name. His name is Baba Jide. <laughs> so we call him Jide. So now I'm sort of like struggling to say, what will I tell Jide about who we are as a family? You know, because uh, I want to leave him something. I want to leave him memories of his, the grandfather he never met. 
and the father he never met. So I started thinking more of this book as not just about the 10 libraries that formed me, but they fo those libraries formed me in the context of a family that formed me. So that's what this book became in the end. So it's a love letter to my dad and to my brother and really to my, ho to my whole family. And I mean, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather had two wives. And between him and my mom's mom, my, sorry, my, my dad's mom, there are about 250 descendants. So when I tell people that people buy my books in Zimbabwe, I've got a captive audience. It's the family. <laughs> <laughs> I can sell 400 books with my, at one book launch because, you know, every cousin come, pops up, you know. <laughs> so, so it's really a story as well about my dad's life and how he grew up. Thank you so much for your kind question. Um, excuse me, oh, people on this side. You people on this side, I haven't asked questions. I'm just having fun without working hard. <laughs> uh, there is, is somebody on this side. Do you have questions? How, 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 how is that? I, I'm sorry I said you were in the chief seat. Don't be sorry, because at this point, <laughs> two more hands, please. Um, there's one person here. What, who, is, who has the mic? We now have nine minutes, so you better keep it short, eh? Don't ask questions that require thesis to respond to. <laughs> but yes, yes, yes. Yes. Hello, hello. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, my name is Mkuki. I'm a publisher from Tanzania. Um, and we'll be publishing Out of Darkness in Kiswahili. <laughs> um, so my question is, are there any other indigenous African languages that any of your work has been translated into? Because I think it's... We also it's don't like the word indigenous. Okay, all right. Um, African languages. African languages. Thank you, Thank, you. Right. Thank you for correcting me. No. Are there any other African languages that? Yes, so um, Zukiswa's favorite story, the Mpandawana Dancing Champion, was translated into Shona and actually was translated by two of Zimbabwe's finest writers, Mungoshi, Charles Mungoshi and mm. Musaya Mura Zumunya. Mm. So it was such an honor. And uh, I'm actually writing a novel in Shona at the moment. Um, it's a murder mystery in Shona, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But I've also uh, just finished a project where I'm trans I translated Animal Farm into Shona. Fantastic. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and we're turning that into a Shona play for, for school and so on. So um, I, I don't just focus on my work being translated into my language. I also write in that language, um, especially plays and translation. And thank you so much for... Uh, I know I guilt tripped you into the Swahili publication, but I don't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone in the middle. That's me. Ah. Hi, Petina. Sorry. Um, we met last night at the airport, and I asked, or oh, like you were wondering who am I, and I said, oh, I'm a big fan of your work. I love a uh, book of memory. And you said, oh, it's such an old book, but I've been pondering over that statement because the book of memory, even if you read it today, you know, what is happening in Zimbabwe, you know, still happens, you know, like the horrific uh, scenes from prison, you know, it's what is happening today. So I just wanted um, to get more about what you meant because recently someone also said um, there's a theme around uh, being queer in Book of Memory, and when I thought about it, I said, oh, that is Simon, but at the time when I read it, I didn't see it. So for me, it's timeless, and I don't think your statement is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so cute, that's so kind. Actually, I think what I said was, that's an awful book, not an old book. Um, oh, awful. <laughs> yeah, awful, right, like honestly, I, I, I last read it on 14 June 2014, from cover to cover, because I had to for the proofreaders, right? Uh, but when I read it, when I read from it, in, in, in when I promoted it, I would choose only three pa passages uh, to read over and over again because I, I can't read that book because it's, it's so bound up with my imposter syndrome and it's so bound up with my self-doubt and the fact that it won a couple of awards and people like it. And it's been <laughs> I'm like, what? Are you serious? You guys have really bad taste, you know? <laughs> but... <laughs> But but genuinely, I think because I think maybe a time will come when I can read it without all the 
trauma and baggage associated with it. But for now, honestly, I can't. It's, it's not a book I can. I actually cringe when I see it at airports, and I kind of like turn it the other way. <laughs> uh, very different from Elegy for Easterly. It came out the same year as one of Barack Obama's books. Oh, my sister and I went around London, putting my book next to Barack Obama's book. <laughs> like, because <laughs> I was really proud of that one, and I wanted everybody to buy it. But uh, thank you so much for the kind uh, comments on the Book of Memory. Yes, there's. Um, I I don't really know if. I can use the word queer because I don't know that I know what it means, but yes, there is uh, uh, a, a theme of homosexuality in that book. And in fact, my favorite question from any book club was the Kenyan book club that demanded to know exactly how Lloyd died. And when I told them, there was this big cheer because they had all understood it. So um, yeah, so there is that, uh, and you're right to say that uh, prisons are very much still places of misery and I'm actually doing this thing now in Zimbabwe where I'm moderating debates on the death penalty around the country because I'm, I'm, uh, this is going to be my passion project for 2024. We have to get rid of the death penalty. And the, the Book of Memory is about the only woman at that time on death row and it's actually based on somebody who really was the only woman on death row. So certainly, even uh, though I might dislike the book and I cringe every time I think about it, because I get hives. <laughs> oh, shame. I hope no one is, I hope no one is hurt. <laughs> I, I was actually saying I break out in hives every time someone mentions the book of memory, but very much the themes that are in it, the death penalty, prisons, you know, how we treat people with albinism, yes. how we treat people with disability. You know, in my language, if you're a disabled person, you are removed from noun class one for people, and you're put in three noun classes for objects, you know. So how we see disability um, and difference is something that very much still concerns me. Thank you so much. Um, so we, we have three minutes left. Um, so you know, I have been mourning Yvonne Vera forever. Not been stopped. Um, so my question is, how do you feel or see Zimbabwean women writing? Hmm. I <coughs> if you look, uh, there's a Guardian uh, post I did a few years ago called my top ten books about Zimbabwe, and in my top ten, Cecilia uh, Ngarimbwa, Yvonne Vera, Ramvuzo Marechera, obviously, I there's something incredible happening in the Zimbabwean literary space, the women are just taking over, right? No Violet Bulawayo, Novia Rosia Chuma, Spiwe Gloria and Lovu, such lovely names as well, three names. Um, and there is um, Sunyati who writes popular fiction, uh, great fun, she's a, she's a very fun person. Um, so th there are a lot, and there are a lot more coming down the pipeline. I just saw Blackbird, where's Tabisa? I just saw Blackbird published a book Makanaka, exactly. So I've, j I've just put that aside because I, I, I want to read that. I, I have the largest collection of Zimbabwean fiction ever, including Shona novels that were first published in like what 1950, whatever. So I, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled and delighted. But there's a one young man whose name you should keep in your mind. His name is Tanaka Chidora. He is going to blow up. He is like... The it's like the Brian Chikwala, but with, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, a certain ferocity and all the rest of it. And Brian, by the way, his new book is coming out next year. It's called Sh uh, Shamiso. So there's a lot of wonderful things that's happening in, in the Zimbabwean literary space, and I, and I couldn't be prouder and happier for all the writers. Any questions before I go? I have one minute. If you really, okay, what's wrong with you? Question, so we are, are we going to end? Without you people on this side asking questions, looking at me smiling. <laughs> Tony, you don't have a question. You have even, I will allow even a personal statement. <laughs> Tony. Could this be the day? It will be the one day. Please give him the mic. <laughs> on really people on this side. Because... <laughs> Thank you for um, embarrassing me. Um, <laughs> when we had our chat in 2020, yeah. I forgot the question, so let me just ask it now. Was it love 
or duty of colonial mentality. And I made them carry him that this time. Mm. Thank you. Mm. That's an excellent question. So uh, let me preface this by saying that the book took on a force of its own when I read in The Scramble for Africa by Thomas Pakenham that when they took out the body of Livingston out of Africa, they also brought all his papers. And in fact, Livingston maybe wasn't such a failure. He might not have found the source of the Nile, but he found something more valuable, right? That the, you know, the, the, he found the, a mouth of the Congo yeah. down which the ships came the colonial ships and so on. So he inadvertently opened up Africa to the scramble without knowing that this is what he had done. So then I asked, I met Thomas Pakenham. He's, he's, uh, he's one of those you know, old English, you know, he's an earl of something, he doesn't like his title. And he's just the gentlest and loveliest man. I said to him, because he opens the scramble for Africa with the march of the companions. And I said, w what do you think it was? And he said, what do you think it was? And I said, I think it's many things, but one of the things, certainly there was love there. And he said, do you know, I think you're right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's great, interesting. So I wrote love as one of the motivators, right? But certainly there was, there were, because they were diff such a disparate group, and because there were 70 or so, 79 or so, I was able to give different motivations. So Chuma, who'd, who'd been rescued from movement, at the age of 50, for him, love. But Juara, his body man, who dressed him, you know, got him clean and everything, that was love, right? But for some of them, right, it was about getting a reward, right? For some of them, it was fear. If we leave the white man to die here, we'll be blamed for his murder. But if we take him out and is examined and they see that we had nothing to do with his death, we may be able to get on with, uh, with our lives. And for some, it was fear, like, get this white man the hell out of the soil <laughs> because our land is going to be cursed forever. So there were different motivations depending on who was in the group. Yeah, thank you so much. And with that, um, our session has come to an end. Um, we haven't even scratched the surface of the breadth of her work. So this is a writer you must read, obviously, because why am I here? That's what I'm here to tell you. I want to thank Lola and Ake and Patina. It has been lovely. And I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Kina. Kina, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>